Imazine is an incredible effort of libraries across the state of Delaware where they produce a magazine. They produce a magazine made by kids where all their writing, they pick the best writing uh, from kids who participate in the library program, and it shows up in a magazine that people can read everywhere. And some of the poetry uh, and prose is extraordinary. It's an opportunity for kids. What's incredible at this event, when you hear all these different kids go up and read what they wrote, just their imaginations are extraordinary. They, they're they given a blank sheet of paper and they can write anything. They can write nonfiction, they can write fiction, they can write prose, they can write poetry, and the things that they come up with are really extraordinary. my short story, Pecuniary, and then I'll talk about my inspiration for this piece. What do you do when you find a penny on the sidewalk? When it lies helplessly, flat on its back, almost palpably wriggling to move, to get out of the way of the clumsy mallets of our feet. Though of course it isn't really wriggling, and it can't really feel the pressure of our feet. Or perhaps when it sits in a crack along the edge of the sidewalk, tired and dull from eons of touches, transfers, tosses. Do you pick it up and toss it in your pocket, letting it drop and rebound until the cloth dampens its motion? And then do you walk on and forget the penny, allowing other thoughts to trickle into your head until the memory of a coin found in the sidewalk is pushed away, only to be remembered when the penny jams your washing machine? So last Friday at Wilmington Art Loop, I had a conversation about writing, over the course of which I was asked what I write about. And it surprised me that I didn't have an answer. What seemed like such a simple question made me wonder why I write and what I write about. So if I was asked what pecuniary is about, I would probably answer vaguely that it's about a coin lost in the street. Um, however, I seek to shape words into channels for layers of meaning and emotion rather than using traditional plot form. I write because my passion for and fascination with words has always compelled me to use them. As a young child, by telling myself stories, and later by writing stories and prose poems that have their foundations in words. When I was seven, a spelling curriculum that I used contained an exercise in which I had to use spelling words to make a story. Years later, I returned to my idea of creating a story that revolved around words to begin my series of one-page short stories and prose poems centered around Dictionary.com's Word of the Day. Pecuniary is an example of these. For me, writing is about words. Words are infinitely flexible, capable of being used with myriads of meaning. They are shared by so many of us who use the same words every day. Words shape our lives. Thus, my words are shaped by my life and my observations of the lives of others. What do I write about? I write about situations, images, or ideas that I find enigmatic, thought-provoking, or representative of an aspect of our shared human experience. But, most essentially, I write about words. My story is about a teen named Malcolm who has, can who has cancer in his brain and it takes place in present time in Wisconsin. His family and friends are there with him to help him get through it. All throughout the story, Malcolm is extremely positive and, optimi and, op and optimistic and excited for his future. During the final scene, Malcolm is about to go through surgery, which is a terrifying scenario, but it doesn't phase him. The main theme of this story is how being positive produces a blinding effect on how people see the world. For example, Malcolm is being faced with one of the worst possible diseases that anyone could face, but his positive attitude helps him push through it. I got inspiration for this story from how society sees certain situations. People nowadays always seem to be so sensitive and how all of a sudden when one bad thing happens, their whole world comes crashing down. I think that if people have a more positive outlook on life, 
then maybe they will be more happy with themselves and become more successful. Actually, I didn't put this just together right now. It's actually been a part of the story that I've been working on for over a year now. It's called This Is Where It Ends, and it's about how even someone just as young as me can't catch a break in life. I titled my submission, The Ignorance of Optimism, because I wanted to truly show how a positive attitude could change how you perceive life in the future. Thank you. My poem is about God's grandeur. The beautiful flowers, plants, animals, and land make me feel special like I'm in Wonderland. The little bees who collect pollen from flowers make me want to look at the sky for hours. The bluebirds who chirp, chirp, chirp every morning remind me why I'm not still sleeping and snoring. I am thankful for his love, care, and life. Thanks to him, I'll have another family and one day be a wife. Alright, so um, my poem is kind of along the same lines as the last one. It's <laughs> very similar. So it's called All I Ever Wanted Was Speed. Uh, speed limit 40. Pushing 80, I let my baby throttle out a little more. Faster, faster. I didn't see her until I felt a bump, and she was in my rear view mirror, a lump on the road. Oh God, one tiny shoe whisked up in the air by the wind of my wake. Murderer, but all I ever wanted was speed. Um, and I also have like an author's note that I will also read just to kind of give a little background. Um, I wrote this piece to spark a conversation between parents and their children about the importance of safe driving and to raise awareness about obeying the speed limit laws. I know a lot of people who like to drive over the speed limit, but what if one day a toddler walked out and rode in front of you and you couldn't stop because you were going too fast? Suddenly you make one mistake that forever affects your life. You don't want to be a murderer. Drive the speed limit. So um, I wrote this story uh, on the way back, or this poem, um, on the way back from Seaford, Delaware. Uh, my mom and I were um, in, a, in a car and uh, we stopped at a, a red light. And across from us, this kind of like sporty car, it was like a Mustang, um, was going to turn. And when their light turned green, they immediately sped up and they went down the side road. And you could see um, all these tiny little houses, you know, on either side of the road. And I just envisioned what if, um, you know, I mean, they, they were going really fast. It was probably like 25 to 30 miles per hour, and they just kept increasing speed. And what if, you know, a toddler, um, you know, ran out into the road, you know, chasing a ball or something, and then, you know, they couldn't stop because when you're going really that fast, I mean, there's, there's a reason for those, you know, speed limit laws. So anyway, that's just kind of the background um, of what sparked me to write it. So I just kind of, um, I know I said I wanted to start a conversation between parents and their children, but really um, anyone, uh, even if it's, you know, within your household or even in your own mind of, you know, maybe you're a fast driver and, you know, a lot of teenagers think that that's cool to, you know, drive fast, um, you know, but it's, it's not cool if something bad happens and um, it could happen to anyone. So, yeah, I hope it just sparks a conversation, even if it's in your own mind, to just kind of think about how you can be safe to drive. who like homework can grow, grow up to be teachers. How else can you explain the their smiles that they give us homework in piles and piles and piles? Reading, English, science, and spelling? Sometimes I feel like yelling. Just three more pages to read. So I skim through it real, real fast. And finally I'm done at last. Oh, rats, I forgot about math. What's five times five? Oh, maybe, maybe it's 49. 49. This math stuff is such a waste of time. Especially when going outside is all that's on my mind. I guess the answer is for each and every one. Finally, finally, I am done. Saying to myself, who cares? I dart for the stairs and give a shout. Mom, finish my homework. Can I please, please go out? Mom, Mom says yes. I run outside and have a ton of fun. And I came back in and I washed up for supper. And after dinner was done, I was so tired and all I really wanted to do was just watch a little TV and then head to bed. But what do you know it? That's when my father said, Hey, Chris, bring out your homework so we can check it. It took me so long to correct all of my mistakes. And now, now it's time for breakfast. I got a bad taste in my mouth and I can't get it out. You see, this morning, I had my homework for breakfast. <laughs> there are a lot of uh, really bad things I have to do in this job. I'm not sure anything's worse than having to stand up and speak. 
after the Twin Towers. <laughs> so, uh, can we give them another round of applause? Thank you. They, uh, they have some, some children of their own who went to Prestige Academy, which actually is a school I taught at uh, before I ran for uh, county executive. I have four years teaching experience and 64 days uh, experience as county executive. So it, it's real nice to be standing uh, in front of some children and parents. I feel a little bit more at home here than I do at my day job. Uh, I'm here just to say thank you. Uh, thank you to each of you for participating in this. Um, of course, to Diana, Marcus, the library staff, I know some of whom are here. Can we just give them a round of applause? <laughs> to be we honestly have, unquestionably if you look in our state, but if you look around our country, we are among the top of the top library systems in the country, public library systems. Uh, there are a lot of people uh, who think public libraries don't have value anymore. 50 years ago, library was one of the only places you would go for books. Bookstores were not that common. There wasn't, most people didn't have computers in their homes. There certainly wasn't the internet to download books or to order them online. Kids are growing up in a different world today. Libraries are a different place. Yesterday I spoke at um, something called the Osher Center for Lifelong Learning. Does anyone know the Osher Center? For lifelong learning. What it is, it's it's uh, seniors. My parents go there to take classes. They're retired and they want to learn more. So it's lifelong learning. And I speak there periodically about current events. And so I went and spoke and I was talking about all the great things the county does. When you turn on your water faucet at home, you turn it on because the county has a sewer system that provides water. When you flush your toilet, you flush it because the county has a sewer system. When you go to our parks, we have a great park system. Of course, public safety, county police. We all see the county police cars on the road. Make sure your seatbelt's on and you're not driving too fast. Our paramedic ser uh, service actually has one of the highest rates of cardiac arrest survival in the country. And there's a host of services, quality services that the county offers. When I spoke yesterday to Osher Lifelong Learning, I did, I did just that to 100 seniors and I talked to all about the great things the county did. And right when I was finished, a woman raised her hand. She said, you forgot the library. <laughs> I forgot the library. Don't tell anyone that. I forgot the library. And she said, the best thing about the county is the libraries. And I said, well, where do you go to, li go to the library? And she said, she goes to the best library, Hokeston Library. And I said, well, why is Hokeston the best? She's like, she always thinks it's the best. So she goes to another library. She goes to another library, like Bear Library. She's reminded maybe Hope is not the best. So, uh, and I said, so that's true. Libraries are changing. They're dramatically different than they were just 10 years ago with all the meeting rooms and computers and 3D printers. Now all the incredible things you can do at libraries. What do you use the library for? She said, I use it to read. I said, you use it to read? She's like, yeah, when I need a book. I go, oh, I check out the book. And so to these seniors, I said, raise your hand if in the last year, You've gone to the library to check out a book, and I thought maybe five or ten people would raise their hand. Nearly everyone in the room raised their hand. And then I said, how many of you have gone to the library for something other than reading? And about 20 here. So it's important to remember that the, the fundamental purpose of library, which is really community literacy, is still at the heart of, of what we do in the county, what our library system is doing, and really why we're here tonight. You guys are so lucky. Uh, when I was your age, I couldn't be public. Right? It was very, very good to be so, it was so, so difficult to be public. Now we're using technology, of course, to give you an avenue so people can read your stuff. And I just want to end tonight by, um, or end my part of tonight, just by reading one of the passages I found here, one of the poems that I thought was particularly cool. Is Keelan here? No. Keelan's not here? No. Okay. Well, I'm going to read Keelan's poem for a minute. To condescend, it's on page 44. Read it on their own team. The fly says to the dust speck, you are nothing but a dirt fleck. The spider in its web says to the fly, you are just one of the many here that will die. The bird says to the spider in its nest, how could you ever think of yourself as the best? Every animal hears from man, you all tremble under my mighty hand. And the vast universe struggles to contain its laugh as it watches with mirth as the dash 
belittle the death. Thank you very much.